Welcome to Seoul University. We are at 1402 18th Street in Palm Harbor, Florida, zip code 34683. If you want to contact us and you're watching live on the internet, our email address is faithchristianinternational at yahoo.com. That's all lowercase one word. And then our website is souluniversity.org. And then we also have souluniversity at hotmail.com is another email address. Either one of those will work. Um, tonight's message is titled, Do You Dream? And we're going to talk about dreams in a very thorough fashion. But for those that are here in the room, I want to point your attention to this postcard map. Uh, very shortly, we'll have 500 plus of these. This is the back of the postcard. The front of the postcard uh, has a di looks different altogether. Very, we'll look at it in a second. But on the back of the postcard is a map of how to find the church with streets and such. Our, cell, our telephone number, email, address, service times for both the church and Seoul University. And we'll be able to raising the kingdom people. So Palm Harbor, Florida. And um, so in the meantime, uh, look on Facebook. I put them on Facebook. You can copy, paste, and print them. If you want me to email it to you, I can do that. If you want to have print your own copies, or if you just want to send it as an email to somebody, sometimes that's the cheapest way to do things. But uh, tonight's message is entitled, Do You Dream? And uh, let's go ahead and pray before we start, and then we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word tonight. And for those here present in person listening, and those that are watching by live stream on the internet, and those that will go back to the archives and listen, and those that will pass this message out um, uh, you know, on the internet. And then the DVDs and the CDs that will be made uh, later on as well. This is a powerful message. I believe you birthed this in my spirit. Uh, Psalm 37 and 4 says, Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. And that has everything to do with dreaming. And so, Father, tonight I pray for divine understanding about what your dream um, is for us, how you desire us to dream, and the dream we should have for our own lives and envision. And I thank you that the enemy cannot steal this word. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 22. I'm going to read this to you out of the Amplified. And it says this. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light Amen. dwells with him. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. When you dream, you are birthing into your spirit light and revelation of deep and secret hidden things. And in a dream form, you're encapsulating the beginning, the middle, and the end of a length of time. A long length of time when we're talking about a dream and a plan for your life and we're going to point out several types of those dreams and we're going to look at how to have those dreams we're going to look at the purpose of those dreams we're going to talk about our response to those dreams and then we're also going to talk about the dreams that you have when you go to sleep at night and God is invading your imagination and your thought life and speaking to you in even short synopsis of times with even smaller dreams. Um, in, the, in the Hebrew, the word for dream is number 2472. And it means to bind or to make plump. That seems a little blind to us. But let's go on and come back and, and make that make sense. 
Number 1798 in the Greek is the word dream, and it means something seen in sleep. To kind of make this make sense to you, this binding together, making plump, something you see in your sleep, I want to draw attention to a dream I had about eight weeks ago. And in this particular dream, I was laying in bed, totally fast asleep, and just before I woke up, I dreamed that one of my deceased mentor, mentor, people that have mentored me with their life as a role model and their teaching um, and their example, appeared at the foot of my bed. And I was asking them questions about life and about teachings and things. And without even opening their mouth to address the question with words, a look of such compassion came upon their face and mercy. And they laid their torso across my feet and, my, and the bottoms of my legs from the knees down. And they pointed to a man who appeared in the background in the dream whose face seemed to shift and change. And I saw various other living ministers whose faces were represented in this dream. And the man that was laying across my leg pointed his finger at this man's face and then pointed to my feet as if to say, I'm assigning to you the task of taking up where I've left off. Or at least that was my understanding of it. And then I woke up. Seconds before I woke up, I saw in a flash myself on Interstate 40 right outside of Asheville just before you enter to the Smoky Mountains going towards Knoxville and there's an interstate <coughs> exit there where you would get off and you would go to the Cherokee Indian Reservation you'd go to Western Carolina University and at this exit there's a huge house that's sitting on top of a mountain and it looks like a valley of mountain tops which is almost like a contradiction in itself and as I'm standing there, the most beautiful house appears, and I'm standing in the front yard, and I have this assurance of something done. I have this assurance of peace that I've finished the course, I've run the race, and I'm done, and I didn't miss it. And then I woke up. Now, I'm going to point out some rules to follow. There's always rules when there's freedom. Uh, and responsibilities that go with this kind of a thing. But the very first thing I did was I didn't do anything at all about it to make it happen. That's the first thing I did. And it passed the test for me because first of all, if you wake up and you have a dream and it brings you bitterness or brings you anguish, nine times out of ten, that's not from God. That's the devil or just too much pizza the night before, or ham sandwiches, ham and sandwiches. <laughs> Secondly, if, you've, if you don't remember it, or it seems vague, forget it, it wasn't God. Because if it was God, you'd remember everything there is about it. Now, sometimes that's true with the devil because he tries to shock and awe thing. So it has to, <laughs> the rule is peace. Does it bring you peace? Because, see, the devil's the author of confusion. God is the author of light and life and love. Amen. Well, two day, the next night, I was teaching here in this, in this class, and Brother Al asked me to go with him to Sarasota, Florida, to hear one of the men speak whose face appeared in the dream that my mentor had pointed to. And then pointed to my feet and said, take care of it. And so I, I immediately began to get some understanding of my dream. I began to understand this thing is at least in part starting to come to pass. I bicycled down to Al's house because I wanted to. Uh, I'm all about the exercise. And I stopped off to get my hair cut in Largo on the way down there. Just randomly, I thought, picked a place. I just was looking for the first place and popped in. 
They cut my hair. We have a great time talking about Jesus and stuff. I'm leaving to pay, and another hairdresser is standing on the phone, and all of a sudden, out loud, she says, Waynesville, North Carolina. And I looked at her, and I almost passed out, because that's the exit that I was standing at in the dream when I had that dream before, that where the big house was on top of the mountain, the valley of mountaintops, where you turn and you can go to Western Carolina or the Indian Reservation. That's the Waynesville exit is the name of the exit. And she just happens to blurt that out on the phone standing next to me. And we had a little conversation about that, and then I went on. Well, I got to go to the meeting that night, and I sat eight feet behind another person whose face appeared in that vision of a living mentor in my life that was mentored by the deceased mentor. That was amazing in and of itself. Then I got to go back the next night and I got to hear them speak and then they called all the ministers up and laid hands on us to impart the anointing that's trickled down onto them from their people into us. And I've never been the same since. Now, that's a dream, and then there's the interpretation that, that was, uh, it, 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 it was bound, the dream was had things in it that were bound together, which made it plump, okay? And piece by piece, day by day, it began to be unveiled. Not to be outdone, the next night I found out that the one minister was going to be in Miami. And Al's mother lives just north, so we got to go hear him again. And both churches that the minister spoke in were pastored by a pastor more. I kid you not. So, dreams do come. And they do come from God. And they do come to pass. But we're going to talk about these kinds of things tonight. If you want to, even if you don't want to, <laughs> because if you weren't here, we're here I'd still be, still be talking about it. But I want you to look for a quick second. We're not going to turn to every place in here, but I'm going to point out because I don't want it to just go long for long sake. And you can get a copy of these if you want. Um, I'll have these on Facebook probably tomorrow. But I want to look at different types of dreams because not all dreams are the same. Genesis 28 and 12, and you don't have to turn there, is a picture of Jacob's ladder. Jacob went to dream, and he saw a ladder appear in the night, a ladder that extended up to heaven. And then afterwards, he wrestled with an angel all night long and prevailed and got a name change. All right? That dream represented a shift in the namesake of Jacob. That dream represented a born-again experience. Jacob's name uh, meant swindler. Okay? He was just as much called of God when he was named Jacob when he was swindling as he was Israel when he got his new name, which means salvation. Amen. But it was at the point that he began to wrestle with the angel that he got his limp and his name change. And so sometimes God comes in dream form in your life when he's shifting you, not even so much in your geographical direction, but in the essence and the character of who you are and who you are known as. Now, he can do it while you're asleep or he can do it while you're awake. But Jacob happened to be asleep. Genesis 31 and 10. I want to turn there. And this will be able to amplify. Genesis chapter 31 and verse 10. And I had a dream at the time the flock conceived. And I looked up and I saw that the rams which mated with the she-goats were streaked speckled and spotted. And the angel of God said to me in the dream, 
Jacob. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Look up and see all the rams which mate with the flock are streaked, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban does to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, and where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out from this land, and return to your native land. This was a dream of prosperity and direction. In, in the, uh, the mating of the animals, Jacob had made a deal with Laban. And he says, I'm going to watch your flocks one more time and then I'm leaving. Right now, all I have is the shirt on my back and my wives and my kids. And I have prospered you. God has prospered you through me. All these many 14 years I've served you. You've changed my wages 10 times. But this is it. And here's the deal we're going to make. When I leave here, I'm going to take with me all the ring straight, all the speckled, and all the mottled or spotted animals with me. And that's my pay. Laban said, who himself was a swindler, it ran in the family, what a deal. I don't have a single animal that I know of like that. <laughs> but what Jacob did was he capitalized on a principle in the Bible that it says, what you see is what you get. Is that where they get that from? What you focus on <laughs> is what you become. What you see is what you got. And so Jacob went to the watering trough where they made it, they made it as they drank, and he put pictures of spots and speckles and models in front of the strong animals as they made it. He peeled the bark off the trees and he created like, like it, we would do it now, we would make it a video. Animals made it and put a video in front of them. If you want big animals, put big animals in front of them. And as they make, they produce big animals. I mean, that's the principle. All right. And in front of the weak animals, nothing. And so as they began to mate, all these strong, spotted and speckled and modded animals came out. And the deal was, they're Jacob's. And Laban agreed to it because he was did not know he was going to be deceived. He himself was deceived. And he had sown deception, so he was reaping it. And so this dream came to Jacob to confirm God is with you and he sees your trouble. And he's rewarding you and confirming and affirming you and now giving you new direction. So the first dream was a dream of Jacob's ladder. It was a name change. It was a salvation experience. This next type of dream is a dream of prosperity and direction. In Genesis 37, verses 4 and 5, we're, we're close enough there, let's go by it. Genesis 37, verses 4 and 5, it says this. But when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not say peace in friend greeting to him or speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream. God knows when to visit you with a dream. Amen. God knows when you are at the end. <laughs> and He knows where you are. Amen. Amen. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. And they hated him still more. And he said to them, listen now, I hear you, I pray this dream that I have dreamed. We're going to get to how you handle a dream in a minute. I'm not going to detour and talk about what we could talk about right there. We'll come back to that. So in this dream, Joseph had a dream of destiny. It wasn't a salvation experience. It wasn't prosperity and direction. Joseph had a dream of destiny. God showed Joseph in picture form, the end from the beginning. Go to Genesis 40 and 8.
the difference between what I teach and maybe what some others teach is that when I'm ministering, and I said this Sunday, and I said this Sunday night, if you were peeling the flesh off of my spirit, and all you could see was my spirit, what you would see when I'm ministering is this right here. Here's a dream. Here's a gift. Here's miraculous faith. That's what's happening in this room and those Amen. watching Amen. on the Amen. internet Amen. right now. We receive that in the name of Jesus. I don't even have to stop and say, would you like to pray for one? It's just happening. You're sitting under that anointing. It's taking place. You're in Amen. the room. Amen. Amen. Genesis 37, uh, excuse me, 40 and 8 says this. And they said to him, we have dreamed dreams, and there was no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams, I pray you. And so in this story, Joseph is not the one having a dream. Joseph is interpreting someone else's dream. And both dreams are dreams of judgment. So sometimes dreams come to reveal God's judgment. Or in the other case, His mercy. And these, both of these dreams came to pass exactly as Joseph said, them, said that they would. One got off scot-free and was restored. And the other was hung. So dreams come... And the important thing to do, and again, I'm going to hold off on the principles, but, but I'm going to show this, say this, is don't do anything about them. Just, just leave them be. Experience them, have them. There's some things we're going to talk about that you can do, but in the grand scope of things, just leave them be. Because you might be thinking you're having a prosperity dream and you're having a judgment dream. You might be thinking you're having a judgment dream and you're having a mercy dream. Or you might be thinking, you're having a dream, and the dream ain't for you at all. So we're going to go through some steps on how to handle dreams. Okay? But, but, it, but it, the very first thing to do is just don't do anything. But, but what a few things we're going to talk about in a minute. You know, that'll make, it'll make sense when we get there to the how, our response. This is down the page a bit. The next one is Gen Genesis 41 and 1. After two full years, Pharaoh dreamed that he stood by the river Nile. And behold, there came up out of the river Nile seven well-favored or fat, sleek, and handsome cows. And they grazed in the reed grass in a marshy pasture. In the east, in the east, because they are not as School educated as the way we are in the West, which is more of your mind, the, hip, the, 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 um, the, the way that we've been taught in the West, we've been taught to think, to mentally reason through things. The way that they are brought up in the East, and by East and West, I mean as in continents. I don't mean as in East, East, Tennis, East America, West America. I'm talking about the, the West of England. <laughs> Or west of Africa, maybe is the way to say it, versus Africa and east, is there more in the imagination, more in the dream, more out of the spirit? Okay? They're, they're, it's just two different philosophies. And it's evolved over thousands of years. Okay? Now, Holy Ghost Spirit filled Christians have the ability to tap back into that. And so I'm not saying this is a broad brush for everybody. I'm saying lost, the lost world, the world, by and large, when you come up in the educational ranks, it's more common that you'll say you had a dream and tell it in school the next day in Africa going east than it is in England going west, okay? So, uh, next thing is in this, in Pharaoh's dream, he was dreaming of prosperity, but he was also having a dream of wisdom. God was giving him wisdom. Because right after this, seven skinny cows came and swallowed the fat cows. And there was an interpretation that harvest, abundant, super abundant harvest of seven plentiful years was coming, but then seven years of drought was coming that would swallow it up. The only reason I'm taking the time to draw attention to this is because when I was in 
North Carolina and Tennessee recently with the fellas, we met a Choctaw Indian and his family. And I did not share this with the church on Sunday. It just wasn't time. We didn't get there. This is a privilege for the ones that came tonight, I guess. And then Sunday night I mentioned it. But as we began to minister health and healing to him and his family and prophesy, he himself said he saw a vision of the entrance to our church. And he said he saw a fat cow at the entrance to our church. He says, now I did not know what it meant at first, but then the Lord told me the interpretation. And he says, it's the same as in Pharaoh's dream. Tell him that his church has a fat cow in front of it at the entrance. And from now on, for forever, is going to experience prosperity Amen. And, wealth and increase. Amen. Forever Amen. was the word Amen. that the spirit filled Choctaw Indian said about the entrance to the church. Amen. On the highest point in Tennessee. Daniel had a dream. Or Daniel is, listen, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 16 through 28. Daniel is put on the spot for another type of dream. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would set a date and give him time and he would show King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation to his dream. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, so that they would desire and request mercy of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Daniel and his companions should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. Because, see, Daniel was reading about Nebuchadnezzar. He was reading about Joseph. He was reading about Pharaoh. He was reading about Jacob. He was reading about Abraham. We should be reading about these things. We should have this in our utility belt. This should be a tool in our life. An anticipation of a dream from heaven. Who has given me wisdom and might and made known to me now what we desired of you. For you have made known to us the solution to the king's problem. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said to him, Do not destroy them. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought him in before the king in haste. And he said, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation of his dream. And the king said to Daniel, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation of it? So listen. If you don't have a dream, if you've stopped dreaming, if you're stagnant, guys, why don't we try to put him in that baby bed and, and rock him? The brown thing? The brown one. Why don't we try I think that? he's too old for that, but I'll give it a try. And Not only does God have a dream for you if you don't have a dream. God is showing here, I can cause someone else to dream a dream who's not even saved, not even in covenant with me. Cause them to forget it. You ask me about it. I'll tell you what the dream was and its very interpretation. I think God is just saying... If you need to run a mile, I can show you I can run 10. If you need to lift 50 pounds, I can show you I can lift 500. If you need a dream, I can show you not only can I give you a dream, I can give you other people's dreams and what they mean. So don't set your sights too low. Set your sights high. Does he have a pacifier? Does he do that still? Does he have a bottle? Let's take, it, let's take care of him. We don't need him 
I don't want him on the floor because we're trying to solve a problem, a rodent problem. Okay. And I don't want him on the floor. Uh, just for his safety's sake. Plus, it's a distraction, too. And, uh, but anyway, um, in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, the Holy Spirit breathed this through the pen of Paul, and he said, when you pray in other tongues, you don't pray into men, but you pray unto God. Have it in the spirit. You speak mysteries. You talk secrets. You talk about things that are hidden becoming revealed. And we have plenty of toys he can play with too. We can really occupy his time if we put our hope in it. We need a dream. We need a dream. From Micah. Now. Praying in other tongues is a very surefire way to birth a dream in your heart. It's a very surefire way to get understanding of other people's dreams. Now in verse 47, I want you to notice something in Daniel chapter 2. It says, The king answered Daniel, Of a truth, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secret mysteries, seeing that you could reveal this secret mystery. So this dream... We talked about dreams of prosperity. We talked about dreams of salvation experiences. We talked about dreams of increase, of direction, of destiny. This is a dream that explains and reveals what's hidden from man's sight and man's knowledge and man's mind. That just hit a Holy Ghost note right there. This is a dream that reveals things that are not in the mind of man. This is a dream that brings to light that which is secret and that which is hidden. The scripture says that it's the honor of, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the honor of kings to search it out. The Bible says that the secret things belong to the Lord. And, and I discover in the Bible that he reveals secret things to faithful and loyal people. That's what I've discovered. Go with me to the New Testament. Look at Matthew 1 and 20. But as he was thinking this over... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And again, this is tapping into things that are secret, things that are hidden. Now, it wasn't secret that she was pregnant. That was the cause of the turmoil. That was the need for the dream. But what was secret to Joseph, even though she was telling him the truth, was the affirmation of someone else's word. Mm -hmm. So dreams, other times of dreams, are dreams that affirm and confirm the integrity and the honesty of others. I had a lady in Africa dream a dream about me the night before a major healing took place in her life. And she says, I had a dream last night that someone looking like this man up here was ministering to me. But I could not tell if he was of God or of the devil. But then the very next day she was in church. And at the very beginning of the sermon, and I told you this story before, I walked over to this section of chairs and said by the Holy Spirit, there's someone in this section right here and you have tremendous pain in your kidneys, in your kidney area. That pain is leaving your body right now. It was her. She was pregnant. She was right under my hand. I'm going, there's somebody over here. Somebody over here. Well, I'm sure that confirmed her I wasn't of the devil, <laughs> that I was of God. But he used a dream to draw attention to it. Now, notice in Matthew chapter 2, everybody's having dreams. Look at verse 12. And receiving an answer to their asking, they were divinely instructed and warned in a dream 
not to go back to Herod. So here again, dreams in the New Testament are showing motives of men's hearts. Joseph was given a dream to show the motive of Mary's heart. The wise men were given a dream to show the motive of Herod's heart. Evidently, he was a pretty good actor. Because he acted like, hey, come and tell me where the child is when you find him. I want to worship him too. Some people are snakes in the grass. Some people are smiling and waving at you. And they got a, a Mr. Fantastic arm stretched around behind you, stabbing you. And you have no idea at the time. The Bible says that every man proclaims his faithfulness until another man comes and investigates it. Look at verse 13. Now after they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, tenderly take unto you the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you otherwise, for Herod intends to search for the child in order to destroy him. So he was given a dream and warned of foreboding destruction and given direction. So there are dreams that do such things. Amen. Now, look at verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Maybe Joseph wouldn't have gotten that information on the World Wide Web, mainly because it didn't exist. <laughs> and who knows how long it would have been. Who knows how long it would have been before word got down to Egypt and then Joseph would have known without needing a dream that it was safe to go back. We're not going to do this now. This is for Sunday coming. But let me tell you how right on the money God is. In Daniel chapter 9, there is a prophecy given that on this, on this specific day, it's a hundred, I'll look the number up again, it's like 144,000 days after a king gives a decree to rebuild Jerusalem that the Messiah enters Jerusalem on a donkey and then is rejected. And then the temple is destroyed again. Daniel prophesies that in Daniel 9. If Jesus had returned to Egypt one day late, that might not have happened. But on Palm Sunday, Jesus strolled in Jerusalem on a donkey on the very day. You can count the days up from the decree to the day he rode in. And it was a, what it was 144,000. I'll look it up. But that's the very day he walked into Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I mean, if you had known the word like the wise men knew, like Daniel knew, you'd have been standing there with all you and your on that day with palm branch in hand, bowing <laughs> before the king of kings because he did it on the very day. Do you remember when he told Mary, woman, my time has not come yet? He really meant that. He wasn't trying to be humble or harsh. He's saying, I can't start till such and such a day. It, it, it might have been the same day and it had been an hour early. <laughs> That's what he was saying. Now, look at verse 22. But because he heard that, well, we, we covered that already, verse 22. Look at verse uh, Matthew 27 and 19. Matthew 27 and 19. Also, while he was seated on the judgment bench, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that just and upright man, for I have had a painful experience today and a dream because of him. God will tell others about you and your authenticity and integrity in dream form. So sometimes when you ask God for a dream, he may say, okay, I'm going to give it to so-and-so. And they're going to be used of God to affirm and confirm 
what I'm doing in your life. Now, he can do what he wants to do. I've had that happen before. I've had a couple of people that lately tell me they saw me uh, walking through their house in the middle of the night, praying over rooms and praying over people. <laughs> I was fast asleep in my bed, as far as I know. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But I mean, I've had that happen. So we've talked about types of dreams. Now, let's talk about purpose of dreams. Turn with me to Proverbs 29 and 18. Because everything God does is purposeful. And it's not just enough to ask for something. If you don't understand the purpose of something, you're, you're most likely going to abuse it. You've got to understand purpose. And so Proverbs 29 and 18 says this. Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. Another translation says they cast off restraint. When there's nothing holding you in, when there's nothing corralling you, inspiring you, taking you higher, you're likely to just throw off restraint. Boredom is simply free time that you're not used to having without a plan. It's time you're not used to having that has no plan. That's what boredom is. So if you're ever bored, say, oh, I need a plan. It must be that I'm not, I'm not used to having this time. I need a plan for this time. Now you'll be bored anymore. I know that sounds like deep rocket science, but <laughs> no. It's <laughs> simple stuff. That makes sense. So one of the reasons that you want a dream is to be able to discipline and, and, and to corral your energies and your efforts and focus them in a specific way in a specific direction. And I mean, you might need to dream for your whole life. You might need to dream for the next five minutes. You might need to dream for the next year. Psalm 65 and 11 says, He crowns the year with His bounty and favor. The, the, the wheels of His chariot drip with fatness or abundance. There's a good dream for this whole year. Dream of elongated times of blessings. Until you get a specific dream, that would be a good verse to frame your dream. Amen. Amen. Because I, I want to make it clear, we're going to bob in and out, weave in and Amen. out of dreams when you're actually asleep that he gives you versus dreams that you write out on paper that come out of your heart when you're wide awake. So I don't want to limit dream to just what happens when you sleep.